Hello, comic creators. In this week's episode of the Comics Industry Commentary, we look at Viz and their pricing model, IDW and their moves in Hollywood, and a possible contender to Kickstarter. My name is Kamal Hennessy. I'm an attorney, author, business consultant who specializes in the comic book industry. And before we get to the news, we need to talk about some housekeeping items. First, tomorrow, is the Women in Comics Collective Creative Conference. And I'm gonna be speaking there at about 12, 12.30 to talk about comic book law, comic book contracts, and what comic book creators need to look for when they're looking at different kinds of agreements for their work. So if you're gonna be in New York City tomorrow, it is free at the New York Public Library. The link will be in the show notes. So come and check it out. I will also be in Seattle for Emerald City Comic Con on the 18th. And I'll be doing a panel there with several highly uh, qualified individuals talking about digital marketing and how it can be used to increase the sales of comics on any level of your comic book career. So there will also be a link to Emerald City in the show notes. So if you're gonna be in Seattle next week, love to see you. And finally, this week actually marks the one year anniversary of the Comics Publishing Institute, which is a group specifically designed to help comic book creators increase their understanding and knowledge of the business and legal side of comic book publishing. So if you'd like to check out CPI and the strong community that we've been able to build over the past year, there'll be a link in the show notes plus a discount code that you can use to get 10% off of your membership. And now with all of that blatant self-promotion out of the way, we can get to the news. The first story we're gonna talk about is a company called Crowdfunder, which claims to be, or is attempting to be, a competitor to Kickstarter, specifically in the comic book crowdfunding arena. Um, Tyler James, who runs Comics Launch, did a detailed in-depth analysis comparing Kickstarter to Comics Launch. And based on his analysis, it seems that Crowdfunder was designed specific to, a, to address a lot of the concerns that experienced comic book creators have had with Kickstarter over the years. Now, while competition is good, and there are several competitors to Kickstarter already in the market, you have to actually consider where you are in your comic book career and in your crowdfunding career to decide whether it makes sense to go with Kickstarter or an alternative kind of platform. We've had a lot of discussions in the past two weeks in the weekly Q&A sessions for the Comic Publishing Institute where we talk about the benefits of Kickstarter and the way Kickstarter actually drives significantly more people to a particular campaign because of the ecosystem they've developed over the past five, 10 years. When you look at the numbers for a Kickstarter, you realize that 70 to 75% of all their comic book Kickstarter campaigns are actually successful. And there's certain analytics that show, depending on the size of the group you bring to Kickstarter, because of course you have to bring your own crowd to get the crowdfunding, Kickstarter can actually drive 20 to 40% more individuals to your campaign, which could lead to significantly increased revenue. Now, there's a lot of people who may have issues with some of the things that Kickstarter does in their business practices or their potential move over to blockchain. But if you're a creator who's just getting started or you're weighing the pros and cons of each individual platform, it pays attention to look at what Kickstarter actually brings to the table that the other platforms may not do at this point. In our next story, we're looking at a interview that the CEO of Viz Media did during San Diego Comic-Con where they talked about a lot of the adjustments that they've been doing since the quote unquote end of the pandemic. And the thing that was the most striking in that interview, if you actually take a look at it and the links would be in the show notes, is that they focused on the idea 
that they were not going to raise their prices above the 999 price point. And this is significant because it actually implies a much broader discussion about price theory. Because in price theory, which is the idea of how you actually go about setting the price for your particular good or service, there's three basic prices. There's a discount price, which is pricing your good lower than the competition. There's the competitive price, which is pricing your good the same as everybody else. And then there's premium pricing, which is pricing whatever you're selling higher than the competition. Now in discount pricing, one of the benefits that you have is you get closer to what Viz refers to as a single bill transaction or what is commonly referred to as an impulse buy. If the price of what you're selling, especially if you're selling a full graphic novel for a price that is lower than a lot of the other similarly situated products, you will potentially get more people buying your product. Now, the downside there is the profit margin, the amount that you get for every book that you sell is going to be lower. But if you can actually increase the volume, increase the number of books that you sell, then maybe the individual margin doesn't need to be that high, which it seems like what Viz is looking at. Now, when you're talking about a company as large as Viz, you have to also understand they can keep prices low because they have economies of scale. They have discounts in terms of printing and shipping and distribution that they can tap into that other companies, especially emerging and independent companies, can't. They also may have cash reserves that allow them to work with a lower profit margin that emerging and independent companies may not. So when you're looking at how you're going to price your comics and how you're going to price your services, consider what price theory you're going to be working under and how that actually plays into the larger business that you have. The final story that we're talking about comes to us from Deadline, and it is an announcement from IDW that they have five new projects that are currently in development for film, TV, and animation in 2022. Now, this story is similar to the story that we talked about a couple of weeks ago. We talked about Webtoon saying that they had about 100 different media projects outside of comic book publishing that they had in the pipeline in Hollywood. Now, stories like this are, to a certain extent, stories like this are natural. Every There's a lot of comic book companies that want to be seen as players in Hollywood. And to be a player in Hollywood, you have to be making deals. And if you have deals in development, you are moving closer and closer to that end goal of having a project released. But as we said last time, having a project in development is not the same as have making knowing that you're going to have a film or a TV show coming out. And the announcement comes, this announcement comes when a lot of other companies that are similarly situated are seem to be going in the opposite direction, whether you're talking about what's going on with Oni, whether you're talking about what's going on with Valiant. So it would be interesting to see how many of these projects actually go the full term to actually get a release and how much of the release is basically designed to set IDW apart from every other competitor in the market who is facing recessionary pressures to kind of scale back on everything they're doing, whether it's in publishing or in media. So that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Comics Industry Commentary. If you have any questions, comments, criticisms, jokes, insights, or information that you want to talk about related to the business of comics, please share it in the comments below. Enjoy your weekend and like and subscribe. And until next time, have fun with your comments.